Hi, mate. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing today? Uh, not too bad, thanks. Nice to meet you again. Yeah, I know we had John uh, last year, and uh, now we're back, and I know you got a new book out, Florence Foster Jenkins, The Life of the World's Worst Opera Singer. i got to admit, I didn't know much about her before I saw your book. Uh, could you tell maybe the listeners a little bit about Florence? Sure, happily. Um, she was a rather rich, widowed socialite um, who lived in New York uh, from about 1910 through 1944, She was a trained musician, although unfortunately she decided to become a singer rather than concentrate on the piano, which is what she what she was kind of trained in and I was rather good at. And she wasn't very good. Um, She was really, really poor singer. Um, And uh, we know this because she left behind nine recordings. There are nine tracks available, which she recorded in in the 40s, which are all diabolically awful. Um, and she played the Hollywood, not the Hollywood, I'm sorry, she played Carnegie Hall in 1944 to a sold-out audience. Um, and is, I guess, fated, uh, remembered mostly as just being um, possibly the world's worst singer. So when she's selling out the Carnegie Hall and all these places, is it just basically people want to come and uh, point and laugh? Or, or what was the mystique behind her? I think I think it was two things. Um, she was quite a character. She was certainly one of those ladies that was um, that was very striking. That was certainly well known in her circle. That that had an awful lot of friends. She was very well connected. She knew an awful lot of people. Um, we think of her these days as being you know slightly loopy and a bit eccentric and what and what have you. But she was a very very well connected person who earned a lot or raised a lot of money in the pre-war years and, and during the second world war for charity she uh, a lot of her money the money she raised went um, on the red cross for example um for the war effort um so she was very well liked she was she was um she was very very well thought of by an awful lot of people so some of the audience would have gone along just to kind of humor her to support this woman that they they liked even though she wasn't very good but yes, there was a definite part of the audience that went to laugh. Um, and you had people like Cole Porter and Tallulah Bankhead and sort of people of, of, of that kind of ilk going along because this was like a cabaret as far as they were concerned. It was, uh, although she was very, very sincere in what she did, very, very, she absolutely believed in what she did. Um, a lot of people did treat it as a kind of, I guess, a burlesque. So this was not, uh, I guess, tongue-in-cheek at all. She was uh, very serious about it. Did she know that other people thought that she wasn't very good, or maybe she was so rich she didn't care? Or? She was absolutely sincere about it. She, she really believed she was good. She, she lived for music. Music was very important to her, um, as well as performing or wanting to perform. She, she supported other artists. She wrote songs. She wrote lyrics. She wrote stage plays. She... she design stage sets and costumes and all this kind of thing she was very serious about what she did um but um she also knew uh, that, uh, unlike um the story the story is that she didn't have a clue and that right until the end her husband kept that part of um people's um, reaction if you like from her but no she was aware she was aware that she wasn't taken seriously by a lot of people but she put a lot of that down to jealousy she put a lot of that down to people just not understanding what she was trying to do. Um, she she was definitely aware. She she berated critics who kind of lambasted her for for her lack of uh, talent or performance skills. She she absolutely knew. She kept a scrapbook with it, kept these cuttings in. So when people started to report on her performances and and started to say how bad she was, or and after her records came out, when they started saying how bad the records were, she was very much aware of that. But for whatever reason, she she shrugged it off. She ignored it. Again, we're on the phone today with Dara Bullock talking about the new book, Florence Foster Jenkins, A Life of the World's Worst Opera Singer. And I guess uh, I've kind of read through, I didn't finish the book yet, I'm working on it, but she kind of seemed uh, pretty eccentric as far as uh, not only her performances, but uh, in the recording studio as well, kind of making weird demands and um, recording everything in one take. I thought that was pretty interesting. She absolutely recorded everything in one take, and she was she was adamant that that one recording was the best she were going to get out of her. There was there was no point in, in recording the second time because it couldn't possibly be as good as the first take. So why why waste her time? Why why um, risk injury to her voice if you like? 
Um, so she was certainly eccentric. There's a story that she collected chairs that famous people had died in. It's actually, uh, it's highlighted, that, that little scene is highlighted in the movie of her life, um, the, the one that's coming out uh, in the States in August with Meryl Streep in. And she was certainly, she was certainly eccentric. She was, um, and very funny, I think. A lot of her friends found her endlessly entertaining because of this. She uh, wouldn't accept um, any presents, any gifts that had a sharp point. Her husband once tried to give her a, a, an ornate paper knife, and she absolutely refused it because she thought anything with that had a sharp point on it would would sever a friendship. She was incredibly superstitious, um, but she was she was eccentric. But the recordings are interesting because she again was just absolutely adamant that. This is what she wanted to do. Even at the time she was in, she was well into her seventies when she started recording. So her voice, even if it had been decent when she was younger, was was obviously going to be well past its prime. But she went in, she made these recordings, she did them all for a for a very small kind of vanity recording um, company in uh, near Central Park in New York. And um, but it was it was one take. Let's do this. That's good enough. I'm happy with that. And then let's put it out immediately. So we'll, we'll make a copy of that record from that one recording. And in those days, it was recorded straight to disc. And that's going to be it. The only time she ever, um, she was ever unsure, if you like, about that was when she came back from her first session and she listened back to the acetate recording she was given. She was a little worried about what, the notes at the end of one of the songs. And... Mira Weinstock, the, the lady that ran the recording studio, Melatone Recording Studio, that uh, she made her records in, um, turned around to her and said, oh, Mrs. Jenkins, you needn't worry about one note. <laughs> <laughs> it almost seems like uh, Florence would have been maybe a precursor to um, like a Kardashian or a Paris Hilton or somebody who obviously isn't very talented but uh, very rich, so they just decided to put out albums. Certainly because she was rich, she could afford to do it, and that's, that's something. But I think of her more as, um, say, a, a William Hung or someone like that, someone who might not necessarily be very good at what they do but absolutely believes they can do it. I think the difference with a, with a Kim Kardashian or, or a uh, – or, or, or I forget who you mentioned now, uh, sorry, uh, Paris Hilton um, – if they don't appear to have any talent, certainly, you know, as far as I can see, they have no talent at all. She, Florence was talented, but maybe in a different field. She was a very good pianist. She played at the White House twice. She was an incredibly good pianist in her younger, in her younger days. She was fated as a child prodigy, but she decided um, because she had, um, she had reason no, to no longer play the piano. It's, it said that she had some sort of arm injury which stopped her playing to concert level. So she decided to go off in a different, on a different tack, and that was to sing, and maybe she shouldn't have done that. I, as I said, I can't think of her as someone who maybe, you know, does the um, auditions uh, of um, something like America's Got Talent and, and isn't really good enough, but, um, but still, is, still is entertaining. Well, Daryl, I know you are uh, the expert on uh, the worst records that are out there. I know you collect quite a bit and uh, have written books about them, but uh, the fact that you decided to write an entire book on Florence Foster Jenkins, she must have really been uh, high on your list. When I did the first book, which you know we talked about last year, um, I wrote that so well about three years ago now. She was the first person I featured in the book. The book kind of runs roughly chronologically, and she was the first person I, f I featured in the book. And she's always been a—I've uh, always had a little bit of a soft spot for her ever since I first discovered her many years ago. But obviously, with the renewed interest in her, uh, the fact that there was this film coming up, which I, I knew about um, maybe about you know a year and a half, two years ago. It seemed like the right time to go and visit her uh, story again. And it was discovering at that point that nobody had written a biography of her before, which I thought was just outrageous. You know, how this, this woman could have had this so much infamy attached to her, but nobody had ever written a book about her before. So it just happened about the right time. And then I was lucky enough, while I was researching the book, to, to talk to Florence's uh, cousin, who was, in, who was really helpful, to talk to people who had been at her last concert, to talk to people who were related. Uh, to, I talked to the nephew of, of, of her pianist and all these kind of people that, that you know, had still had some kind of recollection of her life or at least, at least had a tangible knowledge of what she was like. And it just seemed the right time to get this down and get, and, and get this story on paper before it was forgotten. 
Yeah, you mentioned the film. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. And I guess uh, what is it about now that's uh, finally seeing this film come out? Is it just uh, some of her fans? I know David Bowie uh, cited her and a couple other people. Is this just uh, one of those people maybe decided to do the film now? Or what's the reasoning behind that? really no it just seems to all have happened around about the same time there's there's a movie came out in france last year called marguerite which is kind of based on her story there's a german company currently making a documentary about her and then there's the stephen frears film which stars uh, meryl streep and uh, hugh grant and simon helberg which is already out over here in the uk came out, came out a month or so ago but it's coming out over there in the states i think it's august the 12th it just seems to all happened around about the same time i i, I guess Maybe people are fed up with, you know, remaking other movies and they were looking for a new subject. Uh, I know that the writer of, of the movie was, uh, for many years, going, uh, was many years, was partnered to uh, an opera singer. And she uh, was obviously aware of Florence and, and, and brought him, brought her up as a subject to him. So I'm guessing that's where his initial interest came from. But yeah, you're right. Uh, Bowie was a huge fan. It's, it's such a shame that he wasn't around to see the final film. Uh, Barbara Streisand was a fa- is a fan. There are quite a lot of, of you know well known people in the music industry who absolutely love her. You can go back to people like um, the conductor Sir Thomas Beecham and, and and people like that who just adored her. She, um, and I guess for them as well, they see not just the humour in in this in this pretty abysmal performance, the vocal performance on, on these records, but that that sincerity, that absolute kind of belief in just banging forward and, and, and getting on with this and I'm going to do this no matter what I will make this record I will make this concert I will appear at Carnegie Hall even though I'm, you know, I'm 73 or 74 now I am going to do it I can do it and I will do it well Daryl I gotta ask you uh, I'm sure you probably uh, have access to her, some of her original uh, records but I know you mentioned they're pretty rare and on a pretty small label is there a way for listeners to hear some of this is it maybe on YouTube or somewhere Oh, they're on YouTube. They're all, they've all been reissued through um, Sony. So um, it used to be RCA, didn't it? it RCA is now part of, part of I, I think, still Sony in the States. or Sony over here. So Sony have released uh, a compilation which includes eight of her nine recordings. There are other, other uh, record companies that have put all nine together. So, so they're out on CD. They're certainly available on MP3. You can download them from various sites. But um, go to YouTube and you'll find some clips. There's unfortunately no live footage of her performing. There, there was a film made while she was singing. She used to sing in much smaller um, venues before the Carnegie Hall thing. She did a lot of um, private, I suppose what you call them, soirees, you know, private performances for, for friends and for members of the club that she formed. Um, it was only, the Carnegie Hall was the only uh, proper um, public performance, if you like. There was a film made of her performing, but unfortunately that seems to have been lost to time. But uh, there, are, there are clips of this, uh, certainly all the, all the sound recordings are available, so go, go to YouTube and find them. And i got to imagine the original records must be uh, worth a small fortune if you're out of the thrift store or something. Maybe, uh, maybe keep an eye out for them. Well, if you see any of the 78s, they were on uh, Melatone Records. If you, if, you, if you see any of those, buy them, because with this renewed interest in Florence's life, they're starting to pick up, uh, they're starting to increase in price now. I see um, there's, there's currently a, a program from her Carnegie Hall concert uh, on sale on eBay, already $80, and that will go up. That will go well over, to, well over $100, no problem at all. So original uh, ephemera um, of, uh, around Florence is, is currently much in demand. So if you see anything, grab it. Excellent. Again, Daryl Bullock with us talking about his book, Florence Foster Jenkins, The Life of the World's Worst Opera Singer. And Daryl, I know we uh, spoke with you last year about uh, your World's Worst Records books. Have them? Uh, have they been doing pretty well? Have they been selling well for you? Yeah, I'm really pleased actually. The, the, those the, the two World's Worst Records uh, books have done really nicely. I mean, obviously, this is the, the new book, Florence Foster Jenkins, is, is is very different from that. So, you know, I was approached by a publisher to do it rather than kind of doing them off my own back. Uh, and I'm I'm kind of assuming that this one with added publicity will 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 do a lot better. But, um, you know, we'll see what follows next. I've already got an idea for, for the next book, which will be something else music-related. So um, there's plenty more to write about, yeah. Excellent, yeah. I, uh, I know this isn't for everybody, but uh, I'm a big fan of these kind of uh, weird records, and 
I'm glad that you're uh, putting all this work into this, and uh, your website is great. If you can let the listeners know about that so they can uh, check out some of these artists that you have featured. Sure, that would be great. If you go to uh, worldsworstrecords.co.uk, I think it is, or, or just Google the World's Worst Records, uh, I've got a blog, and I, I put up a couple of tracks every Friday, so, so every weekend there's some, there's some new bad music to listen to. I've just done a piece on uh, on a group from uh, Chicago in the I think Chicago in the seventies called the Kaplan Brothers. Uh, we've featured uh, I featured a Rock Hudson recording a couple of weeks ago, which is which isn't anywhere else on the internet. So go and find that Rock Hudson recording with uh, Rod McEwen. Um, yeah, it's great fun. I love it. I'm, I've, I've always loved uh, kind of different, um, out of the ordinary music. I'd much rather listen to something. Um, something obscure and, and, and perverse than, than what's in the charts currently. Uh, and it's, it's a real passion of mine to find something that's, um, that maybe is almost lost or almost forgotten about and, and then bring it back to people to listen to. Excellent. Well, anytime you have uh, something coming out, just let me know, and we'd love to have you back on. I will do. Thanks, Dustin. It's been a pleasure again. All right. Thanks a lot, Daryl. I really appreciate it. You take care. Thank you. Thanks for listening.